Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole wide world to Big Time Open Door Church, y'all. This is the Open Door Experience. Boom! Come on. Hello, my friends watching all over the planet Earth. Man, we would like to welcome you here to Big Time Burleson, Texas, and say we're so happy that you're watching. And we encourage you to fall in love with Jesus. We encourage you to get involved in the kingdom. The sky is not falling, but the kingdom is coming. Guys, do you guys agree with that? Yeah, man, it's so good to see you guys. Well, friends, I'm going to start off here by telling you a story. But in the meantime, I want you all to turn, I want you to open up your books to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 is where, where we're going to be at today. We're going to end up landing there. And I want to tell you that after every service here at Open Door, I like to meet all the first-time visitors. And that's going to be happening again today. And it's, it's typically my takeaway. Now, we do a TV show called The Takeaway, which is after our two services on Sunday, where we get together with the leaders, we get up here on the stage and just say, okay, what's your takeaway? Well, I saw this miracle happen today. I saw this person saved today. Oh, you know what? There was a child that saw her parents get back together today. You know what? It's this sign or this miracle or this wonder happened. Or I saw the goodness of the Lord. I saw I saw this, I saw somebody heal, whatever that is. And I just ask everybody, what's your takeaway? Because friends, we have to own the impact. We have a great responsibility as stewards of what God Almighty has trusted us with to determine what makes an impact on us and what does not. That's a big part of us, of you and I together walking in what the Word of God calls the fear of the Lord. It's where you prioritize the kingdom over all things. You prioritize the king over all things. And you have to own the impact. So I'm always asking, like, you know, Lane, I, was, I spent a couple of days out at uh, Redemption Ranch this week. I spent a, a one full day and a full night with a guy by the name of Tony Timmons. And he's a world famous mountain lion hunter. He actually, actually holds the world record for mountain lion kills, over 360. And I spent, got to just, he's a mighty warrior, very intense dude, passionate, loves Jesus. And just being around him, Leanna was saying, so what was your takeaway? What was your takeaway after, you know, being around that guy? And I said, my takeaway is this. I'm a lot more mellow than you think I am. <laughs> <laughs> so typically my, my takeaway after church is, um, you know, it has to do with some kind of encounter I had with somebody um, in the VIP room and talking to people and people telling me how that they've driven for hundreds of miles to come to our church or they come from out of state or uh, you know what they, they like there's a family that's here right now that came all the way down from Colorado to be a part of the outreach yesterday. They're here. Would you guys just wave at us by the way? Just wave. You guys wave. Yep. Thank you. Where, where, where are you at? I know y'all are in here. I've seen you. Everybody's pointing to somebody else. If you don't know, there's no reason for you to make something up. It's ridiculous. Come on, man, have some class, would you? Anyway, um, those kinds of things are amazing to me, and that's so much fun. So this lady comes to me, and she's there, and she's in line, and uh, I'm getting ready to talk to her, and she talks to me, and she says, hey, she says she drove all the way in from some very, very, very far away place, and she says, do you know how, and I always say, how did you get plugged into our ministry, and how did that work? And she says, well, it all started with a dream. I had a dream with you in it. She goes, you came to me in a dream, and I, that happens a lot to me. And I always tell them, hey, you know that wasn't me, right? There's, there, there have been a large number of people that have come here and said, I had a dream that you came to me and you said, I'm Troy Brewer, look me up. And I looked you up and sure enough, it was you. And I say, well, you know that wasn't me, right? That was just the spirit of the Lord using me as a prophetic type and he wants you plugged into that ministry, whether it's numbers or redeeming your time or, or saving kids out of sexual trafficking or feeding people or whatever, he's trying to show you where there is an open door for you to get plugged in, right? And, and it used to freak me out, and it doesn't. It kind of insults me now if that doesn't happen anymore. That's not true. But I mean, I fully expect that to happen now. I fully expect people to tell me, dude, I had a dream and you were in it and you told me this, this, or that, right? And it's just like a common thing. And, and, and the reason why I think that God would do that is simply because you can look me up. That's it. It's not anything special about me. And again, I have nothing to do with it. I have nothing to do. So... She, so I said, okay, so what happened in our dream? And she said, in our dream, you busted out a checkbook. And I thought, ruh -roh. <laughs> She said, in our dream, you busted out a checkbook and you wrote me a check for $88. 
And you gave me a check for $88. And she goes, I have no idea what that means. And I have come here to ask you, sir, what does that mean? And you know, sometimes, man, you just get put on the spot and people expect you to have an answer, you know? And I think of really funny, inappropriate things. <laughs> so some of it, yeah, so I, I just start, okay, look, I only, have some, I only have so much time, so I just wanna go through this. This is a really big deal. 88, I am a numbers guy, I know about 88. And the first thing I thought, for, uh, the first thing I thought of was Back to the Future. Because you gotta be going 88 miles an hour for the DeLorean to go back in time, right? <laughs> Y'all make fun of me, but see, God didn't give them a dream about you. He gave them a dream about me because he knows I'm a nut. And, and I am the time guy, right? So I'm like, okay, maybe it's a word about redeeming your timeline, back to the future, right? And then I thought, oh, oh, no, 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 I know this. I know this from amateur radio that if you sign out with 88s, a lot of people do that. They do that like in Morse code. They'll just type in 88 at the very end or it carries over into amateur radio. They'll say, okay, man, I gotta, I gotta let you go, 88s. 88s means, loves, it means love and kisses. So I'm like, maybe that's the Lord um, telling you that he loves you. Maybe that's what it is. And she didn't say anything. God didn't say anything. They're like, next. <laughs> I'm like, well, there's 88 keys on a, on a piano. Do you play piano? She goes, no. Next. <laughs> so I'm like, well, let me bust out the word and let me just see when I went to find my notes. I'm like, okay, what are my personal notes on the 88 besides Back to the Future, which I thought was pretty that good one. And I'm like, what does the Bible have to say? And the Bible says that Rehoboam, who is the son of Solomon, had 88 kids. Yeah. I'm like, maybe you're pregnant? It's like, no. I mean, well, Psalms 88 is about having faith and loving God through a really difficult time. And I'm like, is that fitting to you? And she said, no. So now I've run out of 88 verses. Like, what do you do? And I'm sitting there and I'm just looking at her and all of a sudden, the point is that it was a check and I forgot about, I got so fascinated with the number, I totally forgot that it was a check, right? And then I suddenly remembered that there, in all the constellations that are mapped out in the heavens, and praise God for the power of the Holy Spirit, and whenever we determine that oh, God Almighty is glorified through the heavens, I know, because I'm a star freak, that there are 88 constellations. And I looked at her and I said, okay, there are 88 recognizable constellations. There's only 12 that the sun goes through, right? But there's 88 constellations that God placed within our firmament, right? Genesis 1:14, And he did this. And, and the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork and day into day reveals speech and night in the night it reveals knowledge and there is no language where their voice is not heard. But then I'm like, but it's a check. And guys, I wanna just, I wanna show you this. These are, if you're gonna look at all 88 constellations, this is what a map of it actually looks like. And if you ever come to my prayer rooms, uh, if you ever get a chance to come out to Redemption Ranch or you come out to our prayer room or anything like that, I've got these huge monster star charts. Like, why would you do that? Because all of those constellations are for the glory of King Jesus. They're not for witches. They're not for warlocks. They're not for new agers. They're not for some woke knucklehead. They are for the people of God to glorify Jesus with. And I have, some, I have some, some of my favorites, you know. I love the Big Dipper, which are the seven stars, right, which, which point to Polaris. And Polaris represents, represents the throne of King Jesus. It represents the throne of King Jesus. It represents everything circles it, right? Um, I, I, I love Cassiopeia, which represents the body of King Jesus, who is unredeemed whenever Scorpio is in the sky, but is fully redeemed and made right whenever Orion rises, right? I love Orion. Orion's probably the most beautiful out of all of them, and Orion is amazing, and, and, it, and it, uh, the name Orion actually means light. And so the stories of redemption, before it was written in the Bible, it was written in the heavens because the author is the same. Amen, it's the same author. You know, the word dragon is in the Bible 13, exactly 13 times. Well, Draco the dragon has exactly 13 stars in it. Yeah. 
and all that kind of wild stuff. And if you ever hear me doing a star party or some craziness or something that has to do with that, that's what we're doing is, man, we're glorifying King Jesus with the pictures that are in the heavens. And I knew there's 88 of those pictures. And then I knew it was a check. And suddenly, man, the Spirit of the Lord gave me this phrase. And I went, it's heavenly currency. That's what that dream represents. It represents, it represents the currency of heaven. That God Almighty has given you something brand new and that he's given you big time currency in heaven. And she, she was like, whoa. And I told her, I said, you know, the, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter. I was like, you need to search that out. You need to start looking into heavenly currencies because what God values is not what man values. And what makes man rich does not make God, does not make godly people rich. And I was like, you need to know that because there is a new door being opened to you that heavenly currencies belong to you. And Leanna was in there and I told Leanna, I said, Leanna, go bust out a checkbook and let's write this lady a check for $88 so that we, it, so that we can be the fulfillment of this vision. And Leanna's like, okay, she wrote out a check for 88 bucks and I said, now you better cash it in. Leanna told me this last week, she cashed it in. We've been looking for that to hit. We've been looking for it because that's part of the prophetic act, right? Man, you got to carry it all the way through and you can't be limp-wristed about it. You have to be gung-ho all the way through. And I'm like, I'm honored to be a part of that. That's cool. So Revelation chapter three, and I'm going to show you how the Bible talks about heavenly currencies. I want to introduce that idea to you. Revelation chapter three, when Jesus is talking to the church of the Laodiceans, he says this, these things says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation. That by the way is back to the future. He begins at the end and then uh, he announces he's first the amen, which means he's the one that has established everything and we'll see it established. It means the ending. The very last word of the 31,100 71 verses in a King James Bible is amen. Come on. So he says, he says, these things says the amen. He's like, okay, these are the things that the dude who's going to finish things is saying. The faithful and the true witness. I'm telling you, I'm going to stay on it. I'm going to stay true. I'm going to stay on target and I will not stop. I'm faithful. And then he says the beginning of the creation of God. Isn't that interesting how he starts at the end and then goes back to the beginning when he deals with these guys? You know why he's saying that? Because he's telling the Laodicean church, you got some stuff backwards. When Jesus shows up and shows you and say, introduces himself backwards, he's showing you, you got some stuff backwards. And he begins to talk to the Laodicean church and he says, I know your work. Stop, I wanna just ask you. What does he say to the church? I know your what? Not your doctrine? Not your denomination, not your philosophies, not your board, but your what? Your works. The body of King Jesus needs to wake up to that in a really big way. So he says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Man, I wish that you were either cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, It's sad when Jesus shows up to the church and says, you make me want to puke. See guys, this is something you need to know. I heard Jenny Donnelly say this a few weeks ago at the, at, a, at the conference, and what a great woman of God Jenny Donnelly is. She told everybody, she says, guys, I got news for y'all about King Jesus. He isn't nice. Oh, he's kind, but he's not nice. I thought about that and thought about that and thought about that and thought about that and thought about that. That word rocked my world. He's kind. But he's not here for your emotional rescue. I don't know if y'all know that song. He ain't here for that. He's like, I'm not here to just hold you up emotionally. I'm here to set things right. Get with this program. I'm going to be kind to you. I'm not going to be ugly to you. I'm not going to disgrace you. But I'm not here just to be nice to you. I tell you guys, when we do this work all over the world, we're not there to, we're not there to be nice. We're there to change things. Amen. Well, don't you want to get along with the cartel? No, I do not want to get along with the cartel. Well, don't you want to get along with all your critics? No, I'm not interested in getting along with those knuckleheads. Like what? No, no, I want to be faithful and true. I want to be on target, true, and I don't want to quit. So. Jesus shows up to his own church and says, you know, guys, I love y'all. Y'all are awesome, cool, but when I see you, I just want to throw up. 
Not very nice, is it? Okay, then he says this, because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you just don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He calls them five things, five things. And he says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and you're saying everything's fine, and it's not. And then he says this, I counsel you <clears throat> to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you might be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. There's that anointed eyes again, right? Anointed eyes. He said, for as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So as soon as he rebukes them, and I mean, man, he's rough with them. He's not nice. And this is his church. As soon as he says that in verse 19, he says, now don't come to the conclusion that I don't love you. Just get with this program. I do love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. As many as I love, I say, no, you're on the wrong path and I will grab a hold of you. <laughs> I mean, that's how it is for you, right? I mean, you don't go around spanking all the other kids in Walmart, do you? <laughs> you better not. I know sometimes I've wanted to, promise you that. I'm like, put them bubbles up. You ain't bought that, put them bubbles up. <laughs> like, no, no, no man, no man, that's, that's reserved for your kids. And he's, saying, and he's saying, please do not come to the conclusion that I don't love you because that's not true. And then he says this, behold, I stand at the door and I knock and if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and I will dine with him and him with me. He's like, listen, here's the other thing. If you'll hear my voice right now, I'm gonna come into your house and I'm gonna do life with you and we're gonna be a family, right? And then he says, and by the way, that whole thing of family, right? The very end of the Waltons, the very end of Duck Dynasty, the very end of Fast and Furious, the very end of Blue Bloods, right? Where everybody wants to sit and have a family where we all belong. Just, man, we want that. We want a, we want a place, a table that belongs to our, and man, this is our house and this is our family. And we want that place. And he's like, listen, this is what I'm offering you. Hear what it is that I'm saying, and in so doing, you will open a door where I will come in and we will sit at the same table. And I'm gonna get involved in your life in a whole new way and it's gonna be awesome. And then he says, after he says that, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I have overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So he says, not only am I gonna get involved in your human life and sit down at your table, I'm gonna ask you to come get involved in the rule and the reigning part of supernatural things. Like, whoa, I'm gonna come where you're at and I'm gonna invite you to come where I'm at. And this is how this is gonna go. So he's like, please get with this program. I need you to get with this program. I wanna actually, uh, I wanna hone in on verse 18 where he says, this is a very strange thing for, for Jesus to say. After he tells him, man, you're messed up. You made me wanna throw up. You're all jacked up. Then he says this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you might be rich. Man, guys, I want, to, I, want to, I want to share this. Now that, that right there is the King James Version. I'm gonna give you the PTV, which is a Pastor Troy version of Revelation 2.18. I just wanna paraphrase this again when it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you might be rich. Here's how I might put it. My advice to you is to pay the price for what is valuable to me. Pure currency, that will make you truly rich. Man, when Jesus says, I got some advice for you, you better take it. Amen? When Jesus is like, hey man, uh, yeah, listen, uh, I would advise you, I would advise you to pay the price, buy of me gold refined in the fire. What is that? It's, it's pure currency and it's pure so that you might be rich. 
because you're so poor and you have no idea how poor you are. You could have so much of me. You could have so much of the kingdom. You could have so much. And then the next part, he tells them about, about garments. There's three things he tells them they have to buy from him. He says, gold. He says, garments, which is your reward. Okay, and that's a whole nother study. And then the last one is anointed eyes. It's like, what is that? Is this, you pay a price for these things. These are not things that just come with your salvation package. This doesn't come because I love you. This comes because you are willing to pay the price. And I want to tell you, heavenly currency is like that. Heavenly currency is not because God loves you. Heavenly currency is because you love God. You're like, okay, so I need to know exactly how that works. Guys, there is a heavenly economy and there is an earthly economy. This last week, we've learned about all kinds of failings in cryptocurrency and these knuckleheads that are stealing everybody's money and how it's, it's, it's devastating people's lives. And although they say, well, I think, I think that God has failed us. No, a worldly system has failed us. It's a worldly system. Like, well, am I not supposed to be involved in it at all? No, you can be involved in it. You can be involved in it, but you need to have a higher currency than worldly system currency. So it's like, okay, so there are heavenly economies, there are earthly economies, there are heavenly currencies, there are worldly currencies. There are, there's, there is, there is riches from heaven and then there's also blood money. There's prospering in the kingdom and then there's filthy gain. And it's like, okay, whenever Patricia King was here um, about a month ago, my goodness, what a great Sunday that was, by the way. And whenever, whenever, whenever Patricia King was here, um, she said, she said something that just really rings within my ears. She said, you know what? Godly people are putting their whole trust into worldly systems. It's like, you don't need to do that. Like, okay, um, uh, I'm, I'm a business guy and there's business involved in ministry and I've had to learn the past 10 years that when it comes to business, you live or you die by a P&L sheet. Like, what? Yeah, and if you don't know that, you need to learn that. You live or die by the P&L. And it's like, okay, well, then, then a church should live and die by the P&L sheet. Oh, no. Now, listen, we have to have a P&L. We have to be accountable. And we also need to know, hey, do we have money coming in and, and how much is going out and what's going on? No, no, we got to know all those things. That's part of being a steward of what God has trusted us with. But make no mistake about it. I live by financial miracles. I live by a completely different currency. I have the favor of God upon me. I fully expect for financial miracles to happen within my life. You know why? Because I constantly step into dangerous places where if a miracle doesn't happen, everything's going to fail. Right? It's like, well, I've never lived like that. That's because you played it safe your whole life. And here's what's real is, I, I, and guys, it's, this is, I'm not recommending that you just be stupid and dangerous, but I want to tell you, if you're not stupid and dangerous, I wonder what you are. Guys, is it, would the world say to us today that we are smart for being involved on the Guatemalan border right now and saving all these girls whenever people are being murdered down there? Nobody, and guys, I want to tell you, man, the world will not celebrate you for being involved in that because the world doesn't want to be held responsible for their lack of involvement. So they control the narrative and they tell you this is the norm. Well, it's, it's the norm for people that don't make a difference, but certainly not the norm for King Jesus. Jesus sends us out as lambs among wolves. That's what Jesus does. And he fully expects us to be warriors and he expects us to be brave. So there is a real heavenly economy that is at work within my life. And it's evident. I got saved in 1986. And while the Lord has trusted me with a lot more stewardship today, and I praise God for that, and the favor of the Lord has come upon me in many different ways because of how I've handled certain situations. Not because of his love towards me, but because he gave me an opportunity to handle a situation in a different way, and then he gave me the grace, and I said yes. It's really, it's really not fair. It's really and truly not. And that's the first thing I want to tell you about favor, is favor ain't fair. 
Listen, you could be in one situation and somebody smarter than you be in the same situation, somebody better than you be in the same situation, and you'd be the only person that it goes right for because you got favor. And you're like, that ain't, that ain't fair. No, it ain't fair, but it's earned. Man, you gotta fight for favor. You gotta fight for favor. Friends, here's what the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 34. It says, Blessed is the man that hears me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso finds me, finds life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. That word obtain means to gain by planned action or effort. One of the, one of the great things about favor is this. God Almighty will have you be at the right place at the right time for the right miracle to happen. And do you know how you gain that kind of favor from the Lord? Do you know how you earn that? Do you know how you qualify for that? Be the person who's waiting at the door of King Jesus and say, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Everybody else is falling out. I'm still believing you, God, in this place in my life. Everybody else has left, Lord, but I'm still here, and I'm waiting on you, King Jesus. It, it qualifies you to be in the right place at the right time for the right miracle to happen. See, you have to obtain favor. What is favor? Well, favor is demonstrated delight. Favor is divine, adma- divine advantage. Well, I want to tell you, I want to go into a situation going, look, uh, this is weighing over my head, but I still got the advantage. Amen. I do. And remember, what is the advantage? It's the presence of the Lord and it's the favor of God upon my life. That's what it is. The favor of God can be described as tangible evidence that a person has the approval of God. All of us in this room, God Almighty loves us the same. But all of us are not in the same rank of favor. Say that, say that. And I want to just encourage you and just tell you this. Like, why is it some people have more favor than other, than other people have favor? Okay, well, let me just, out of the 10,000 kids that we've rescued out of sexual slavery all over the planet Earth, can I tell you, I, I have demonstrated that my love for all of them is the same. Amen, do you guys agree with that? They all have houses, they all have an education, they all, they, they all have those things. They all get fed, they all get protected. Nobody ever, ever, ever gets to molest those children again, ever. So I've demonstrated my love for all of them the same, but I wanna tell you, all of them don't have the same favor. There's some of those kids that own me. You're like, well, how does, how does that work? You know, Sravani, who's probably watching right now, who's 24 years old now, Got her, we got her whenever she was four. And she's a, she's a married young woman now. One of the most beautiful women on the face of the planet. She is so beautiful. I just want to cry every time I think about her. I just love her so much. Well, I want to tell you, that little girl owns her Papa Troy. And like, why, why is that? Because when she was five, every time I would go to India, she would insist that she carried my Bible. And that little girl would carry my Bible and she wanted to sit next to me. And guys, Indian church services are three and four and five hours long. And that four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 year old girl, she wanted to sit there quiet just so that she could sit by me. And I think, baby doll, there's so many better people for you to be hanging out with. And boy, she didn't think so. She loved me. I'm talking about she loved me. I'm like, okay, whatever she wants, she gets. (laughs) Like, well, that ain't fair. No, it ain't fair. Because, see, she qualified for something that everybody else didn't qualify for. And it had to do with how she demanded to have a relationship with me. That's how favor works. And I'm also going to tell you this, too. My most favorite people in the whole world do and are part of the things that are my most favorite things. Yeah, I mentioned Steve Stone. And man, I want to tell you, this guy right now, I'm here, right here, I'm no cowboy. I would love to be a cowboy, but I cannot throw a rope. I'm too fat to ride a horse now. I, all those kinds of things. I rode bulls from the time I was a ninth grader until the year after I got out of high school, and all I ever got out of it was two broke jaws. I got, two, I got a broke jaw twice, and I got my leg broke. And it, it turns out, riding a bull and being fat don't really go together. <laughs> And I love, and I want to just tell you, man, it's, it's some of, cowboying is some of my most favorite things in the whole world. And it turns out that some of the people I, I respect the most are actually cowboys. Like, so what, so you favor them more than you favor? Yeah, I do. Why? Because they walk in my favorite things. That's how it works with God. God is not a machine. God is a person. 
And there are things that are his favorite things, and there are things that are not his favorite things. And those people who choose to walk in his favorite things find his favor. Uh, it's so simple. It's just so simple. It's just not religious. <laughs> it's like, well, I ain't afraid that gun religious. It ain't supposed to be rela religious. It's relational. I only have just a few minutes left, so I'm gonna move on to another one. But I, I wanna just tell you, you need to learn the currency of favor. And right now, man, you need to think about where are the places that I know I'm favored in the Lord? Where are those places? And are you stewarding your favor? Because it's just like currency. Hey man, I wanna just tell you, I have, I have the favor of the Lord to speak to kings in my life. It's one of the places I'm truly favored. I got a phone call one time, Richard Branson called me and asked me to come down the Necker Island and I went and spit a wink down there because, you know, he needs my advice. <laughs> like, why would anybody do that? What is that all about? You know, Leanna and I have spoke to four kings. We spoke to numerous queens. I don't even know how many queens we've spoken to. And I actually got to preach to the Queen of England. I've literally personally spoke to the Queen of England and told her, what the Lord told me to tell her. And like, well, how did that happen? I was standing in front of Westminster Abbey, minding my own business, and her entourage came down the road and they had to stop and her car stopped right in front of me. I just was at the right time, right place at the right time and I had had it prophesied to me that I was going to uh, preach to the Queen of England. And I'm standing out there with Leanna and the Queen and I look and it's like, Ding. That's the freaking queen. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. And she was stopped and I ran over to the window. I said, queen, Jesus loves you. And dude, her guards were on me like white on rice. Boom, <laughs> he loves you, ah, he loves you. It was like that. It wasn't pretty, but it's powerful, powerful. Like, you don't approach the queen. You do if you got a word, and if it's been prophesied to you that you're gonna to speak to her, man, you be ready, better be ready for that moment because she's liable to pull right up in front of you because of the favor of the Lord. And man, they, the queen's guards are tough, man. <laughs> They're tough. <clears throat> I also have to mention uh, since today is the 20th, and today the 20th, y'all? Well, the number 20 is a number of expectancy, and expectancy is a currency in heaven. Expectancy. Like, how does the number 20 represent expectancy? For 20 years, Israel waited for deliverance through Samson. 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant waited for David to take it back to Jerusalem, 1 Samuel 7, 2. 20 years, Solomon took to build the temple. 20 years, Jerusalem waited for his capture from its capture to its destruction uh, by Babylon, that's Jeremiah 52. Jeremiah actually prophesied for 20 years. It has to do with hopeful expectation. It has to do with expectancy. Now, it, expectancy is different than expectation. And I don't have any, expe any expectations for God. In other words, I don't expect God to jump through any of Troy Burr's hoops, right? I don't, I don't, I, I, Expectation comes with demands. Expectancy is trust in God's character. And I don't know how he's gonna do it, but I just trust him that he's crazy enough to do it because that's what he does. And so actually expectancy is a prophetic posture. And friends, you have to learn the power of, of prophetic, uh, prophetic postures and go, this is a posture of my heart and that I'm living with expectancy. The Bible says in Psalms 85, and this is the amplified version, he says, I will listen with expectancy to what God the Lord will say. For he's gonna speak peace to his people and to his saints, those who are in right standing with him, but let them not turn again to self-confident folly. It's like, look, I, I know what he's gonna do. I don't know how he's gonna do it. I don't know when he's gonna do it, but you know he's gonna show up and speak peace. I'm not gonna bring a bunch of self-confidence to this table but I am gonna be confident in the character of God to do something, and he's gonna have somebody to work with in me. You know, nearly everything I'm involved in is not because I had any of it figured out, it's just because I thought I don't wanna be a part of the problem and God needs something to work with. 
So I'm just going to give him something to work with. We'll just show up and see what happens. We'll just, well, all right, we'll rescue. If we come across somebody, we'll, who knows? He might want to rescue somebody. If we go in that trash dump, if we go to that country, if we do this, I just need to give God something to work with and then walk right into that situation. It's not self-confident folly because I know my capabilities and I'm going to tell you, it's just not much. I had a, had a brilliant young man this morning give me the cry of his heart and he, he deserves this and he's part of our leadership of our church, but he said, Troy, I just, I just want to get to know you. And you know, I can't offer that to everybody, but I can certainly offer it to him. He's a co-laborer with me in Christ. I'm like, okay, you know what, man, we're going to do that, but get ready because it's not very impressive. See, that's this, the thing about favor is people start hanging around you, man, when they see your favor because they think there's something special about you. And then when they find out there ain't nothing special about you, they get mad because you got favor. And they say, well, I can have the same favor. And then they try and steal everything from you. Oh, I've seen it happen so many times. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And I know exactly where people are at in that cycle. And I've learned I will not fellowship in that cycle because I know where they're going to tank at. I've learned. So favor ain't fair, but favor is earned. The Bible says that Jesus himself, he grew in wisdom, favor, and stature with both God and with man. Like, well, I thought Jesus was perfect. Jesus was perfect, but he still had to qualify as a human being for wisdom, favor, and stature. All right. I don't know exactly how all that works, but I know this, man, if Jesus had to do it, oh boy, do we got to do it. So I want to ask everybody to stand up. I want you, if you would, just to take a prophetic posture and just kind of hold your arms out like this because I want you to receive. Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, sir, for heavenly currencies within our life. The currency of the fear of the Lord the, cur the currencies of favor, the currencies of expectancy. I pray, God, that we would learn how to pay the price by following King Jesus into these places. God, that we can literally cash in on it. I pray, God, for the kinds of miracles to happen, Lord God. God, that we're at the right place at the right time for the right kind of miracle to happen, Lord God. God, that just the favor of the Lord is upon us, that stuff that we should have gotten in trouble for, we don't because we got the favor of the Lord. She just received that. Receive that.